We're going to be joined by our guest in just a second, and we're going to find out the latest about a possible leak at a Polk County phosphogypsum stack that's owned by Mosaic. And I should say I invited Mosaic on the show today, but they said they were unable to make it. Uh, that we found out a few days ago about a possible leak of water at that Polk County phosphogypsum stack, and it's owned by Mosaic, and it's at their new Wales plant near Mulberry. That's where there was a massive sinkhole that drained millions of gallons of processed wastewater into the aquifer in 2016. And joining me right now by Zoom is Reagan Whitlock, staff attorney with the Center for Biological Diversity. Welcome back to Tuesday Cafe, Reagan. Thank you, Sean. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, I'm glad you could join us because uh, we want to find out more. I was hoping to talk to Mosaic about this and what they've learned about it, but they weren't able to join us. But, um, you know, we're going to get to the possible tear in just a minute, but let's back it up a little bit and say, what do we know about phosphate in Florida? What is phosphate and where is it mined in Florida? Sure, it's a great question for, for background here. So the radioactive waste that we'll be discussing uh, in conjunction with the New Wales facility comes from phosphate mining in order to make phosphate-based fertilizers. Now, phosphate mining itself is an incredibly destructive activity, which starts with the removal of approximately 30 feet of overburden, or as folks not associated with the industry would refer to it as habitat, soil, vegetation, life. You know, the, there are significant impacts to water quality and biodiversity from this process. But what I want to talk about today is not related to the mining itself, but rather the radioactive toxic waste created during the fertilizer production process, with the, which the industry either cannot or will not safely dispose of. And so uh, th this good, would be a good time for us to talk about how all of that waste is disposed of. So um, you've talked a little bit about the process of mining phosphate from digging it up but how do we how is it processed and how do we dispose of those how is it are those waste products disposed of sure so phosphogypsum and processed wastewater are the two radioactive toxic wastes created during the process of making phosphate based fertilizers and phosphate mining is a very waste intensive process nearly 5 tons of phosphogypsum are created for every 1 ton of usable phosphoric acid produced and the EPA currently requires that this waste be stored in mountainous heaps called gyp stacks, which many folks listening may have seen in their horizon when looking out at Tampa Bay. It's the, the closest thing to mountains that we have in the state of Florida. Now, although these are unquestionably hazardous wastes, they're not treated that way under the law. We have a, a cradle to grave statutory scheme for hazardous waste known as the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. And that exempts these two wastes due to the costs of compliance to the industry for properly disposing of them. And, and I want to state at the outset, the Mosaic Company, the owners of New Wales, reported a net income of $3.6 billion in 2022 alone. They could stand to take a financial haircut in order to be better stewards of our environment. So now let's go back about seven years to 2016. We learned about this giant sinkhole that formed um, at the top of this active phosphogypsum stack at New Wales, and the, the sinkhole went down for hundreds of feet, I think. And tell us what we know about the, the, um, the sinkhole, what caused it perhaps, where the water went, and what, what happened afterwards. Sure. So we live in a naturally porous geographic region, and, and placing mountainous heaps of radioactive waste in ponds above this fragile geology is a recipe for disaster. The New Wales site that we're discussing is a chronic polluter and a problem child within the phosphate industry. You know, it's seen several major sinkholes, including the one in 2016 that you mentioned. There was also one in 1994 that released 80 million gallons of processed wastewater. You know, this facility saw a liner tear similar to what we're experiencing now in March of 2021, which was actually made worse when the company attempted to investigate the tear due to a construction mishap. Now, what's happening right now is considered a potential leak by Mosaic until they can investigate further. But the Florida Department of Environmental Protection has already referred to this as a liner tear in its inspection report. You know, you can think of these gyp stacks as a, an above ground pool. Essentially, at the top of these mountains, there is a hard plastic liner containing a slurry of liquid. Now, when the, the liquid, when the water level in these ponds drops, just like you would imagine in a pool, that water has to go somewhere. So when we see a water level drop, we can assume that there was either a sinkhole or a liner tear because the water is of course going somewhere. 
and our aquifer is placed precariously below. So we can imagine in a sinkhole, it would drop down into the aquifer, but where would it go if, it, if there was a tear, but no, no uh, deep sinkhole? There's no deep sinkhole, but a tear could potentially contaminate our groundwater resources. Now, remember, Piney Point, which is likely a, a facility that many folks listening uh, can remember, started as a potential liner tear. Now, note Mosaic did not own that facility, and that facility was placed very close to Tampa Bay, but it started the exact same way. It started with a potential liner tear that became a confirmed liner tear, and then another, and then another, until it was you know, it had the potential to completely blow and send a tidal wave of this waste into a nearby town. So ultimately, the Florida Department of Environmental Protection released a lot of this processed wastewater and phosphogypsum into Tampa Bay, and that fueled a deadly red tide that killed 600 tons or tens of thousands of individuals of marine life in Tampa Bay alone, including several manatees, sea turtles, and dolphins, species that folks really care about across the region. And nothing changed from a regulatory standpoint after the catastrophe at Piney Point. Now, I'm not saying what's happening at New Wales right now may be the next Piney Point, but the public has to understand that these things are possible. We have already seen environmental catastrophes from the phosphate industry in and around Tampa Bay, and we need to have better oversight of these facilities to ensure it doesn't happen again. Our guest is Reagan Whitlock, a staff attorney with the Center for Biological Diversity, and we're talking about a possible leak of water at a Polk County phosphogypsum stack that's owned by the giant fertilizer company Mosaic. This is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. We're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa, and I'd like to hear from our listeners about what you think about this. You can give us a call at 813-239-9663. You can text 813-433-0885 or email us dj at wmnf.org if you're listening to us live here on October 31st. So Reagan, um, before we go too much further, get to the present, let's just backtrack to 2016 one more time because I I wanna say what Mosaic had to say about that 2016 disaster. we have a we did invite Mosaic on the show, but they were not able to join us. So here's part of what their website says about that 2016 incident. They say that Mosaic subsequently committed to heightened transparency for notable events having the potential to affect the community, and that commitment remains today. The water re- loss resulted from a sinkhole that formed beneath the gyp stacks, which damaged the stack's baseliner, and there were no offsite impacts from that incident. So two things I'd like you to address, Reagan, if you don't mind. Um, you can address the no offsite impacts from the incident in 2016. And also, what are they talking about when they say that they've committed to heightened transparency for notable events? There was There's a lot of um, reporting that has to be done uh, in the public now, right? Certainly, but I, I would push back on the notion that they've increased transparency at all. When we had a liner tear last year, it was considered a possible liner tear for months, and the public did not know that it was confirmed until a backdated letter from FDEP to Mosaic was published online in the public information portal. To my knowledge, the Mosaic company and the industry at large has not embraced public transparency, and that's one of our largest problems. And to the point of the where Mosaic is saying that the water re, water loss from the sinkhole damaged the stack's baseliner, but there were no offsite impacts from that incident. Have we heard from people who have uh, said that their water was contaminated near that site? Uh, I'm not familiar with folks around the area who have reported any contamination, but this this speaks to the, the transparency issue at large here. Piney Point was such a, an obvious issue because we saw the water dump into Tampa Bay. Now, this sinkhole in 2016 garnered international news coverage because helicopters above could literally see a waterfall of radioactive waste headed to the Florida aquifer. Now, Mosaic does claim that they have successfully or are still successfully pumping this phosphogypsum out of the Florida aquifer, but conservationists are certainly not going to be allowed on site to do testing, and I have not seen adequate testing posted that can corroborate the statement that there have been no off-site impacts. Well, I want to remind people that our guest is Reagan Whitlock, a staff attorney with the Center for Biological Diversity, and uh, I want to take calls from listeners during this show. If you're listening live on October 31st, you can call 813-239-9663. Of course, you can always email us dj at wmnf.org or text 
433-0885. And we have a caller now, for, uh, Dave, in North Tampa. Hi, Dave. What would you like to ask? Well, um, on the first topic, um, on Sunday morning, I heard DeSantis um, talk, rave about um, our crime rate here in Florida. And the um, the interviewer said, but the CDC says that gun deaths are up in Florida. And he said, oh, well, if, if you include COVID, and, and nobody's pointing that out, like how ridiculous his answer was, because gun deaths are up ever since um, permitless carry. But um, as far as um, Mosaic goes, um, yet again, there's going to be the fifth toxic bus tour from Walter Smith. Um, and I think it's coming up on November 11th. Anybody can check that out on the Facebook page, just um, toxic bus tour, and it'll come up. Um, and we go over and we, we see um, the mosaic stacks that are sitting, hovering over Apollo Beach, um, particularly our red line community of Progress Village. In what world was that ever permissible, you know, 50 years ago? And yet it, and it still continues. And at the, same, at the same token, there's right across the street is the Tico coal ash pile, which used to be 10. Now they say it's one. And there is a report that says that there's an overflow pipe from the gypsum stack into the coal ash piles, and the coal ash piles empty into our estuaries. And yet, Tico is bragging about the manatees being there. I could go on and on, but thank you so much for bringing awareness to this topic. We need to ask for some um, sanity regarding um, our ecology here in Florida. It's 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 overwhelming. Thanks. Well, Dave, thanks for calling in and uh, for mentioning the bus tour. Yeah, if, if people want to look up the toxic bus tour in Tampa and, and Hillsborough County, uh, that's something that you can do. And we've reported on that. You can find our reports on WMNF.org as well. So thanks for calling in there, Dave. And I want to ask our, our guest, Reagan Whitlock from the Center for Biological Diversity, um, what his thoughts are about, especially when it comes to redlining and building these um, these toxic waste places in in areas that are um, served by uh, minority communities or or people with with fewer means. Certainly, I've spoken to date about the environmental impacts from these fossil gypsum stacks, but we can't forget that there are also incredible environmental justice impacts. You know, these gyp stacks are consistently placed near low income and minority communities because the assumption is that these communities do not have the political voice to be able to fight back. And this is a significant problem. You know, we saw with Piney Point that there was the potential for this liner to tear and to send a tidal wave of radioactive waste into a nearby town. And it is unacceptable that these gyp stacks continue to be placed next to minority communities. All right. Thank you so much for that call, Dave. And I have a whole bunch of emails that I'll try to get to as we, as I can, as we go. So um, John writes, do you know what Mosaic's plans are for the purchase of the East Bay Raceway property, which was supposed to be completed in 2024? Reagan, is that something you know about? No, it isn't. But that, that brings up a good point when it comes to plans for the industry. It, it, Mosaic has made clear that it seeks to expand the New Wales facility. There have been expansion requests in 2021 and 2023, and this has been made clear to be the site that will receive the gypsum from Mosaic's expanded operations in southwest Florida. This is a site that shows significant structural integrity problems, yet it has been deemed as the site that will continue for years to expand and expand and collect more of this hazardous toxic waste. Yeah, our guest is Reagan Whitlock, a staff attorney with the Center for Biological Diversity. And um, we've been talking about the history of the New Wales plants and the big spill that happened there in 2016 and the spill that or the possible liner tear or as the EPA, as the Department of Environmental Protection is saying, the liner tear that's happening right there now. And I should tell people again that we did invite Mosaic on the show today to find out more about this possible liner tear, as they say, but they were unable to make the show. But here's the information that's on their website about the latest possible tear. They say on October 24th, 2023, we provided an update about the new Wales gyp stack. In recent years, we deployed a new monitoring technology which measures seismic activity. The technology is quite sensitive and the monitoring points encircle the stack at various distances and depths. It, it has proven effective in alerting us to the possibility of an issue, which could be occurring far below the stack and liner. We are also employing other monitors to observe changes in water levels in and around the stack. 
That said, we are working to confirm the conditions of the subsurface below this area of the stack. And I'm, I'm continuing to read here from Mosaic's website. We stopped using this area for stacking around a year ago. And since that time have removed the processed water stored on the stack. The stack is within the zone of capture for a nearby recovery well. So in the event there is a liner tear, water released will be recovered. We immediately notified the state of circumstances we encountered. And following that, we have done outreach to the local community and other stakeholders. So that is Mosaic talking about the latest liner tear or possible liner tear. Um, break all that down for us. What does that tell us about what we might know about what's happening there? Sure. The first thing that I would like to address is the implementation of new technologies. Yeah, that's something that they have listed on their website. And I want to be very clear that a few years ago, the Florida Department of Environmental Protection ordered this facility to halt all construction operations because of seismic activity that was recorded and then ordered additional seismic monitoring to happen at the site. Whether what they're currently referring to or not has been ordered by the regulators is unclear. I invite additional technology at this site and certainly have no problem with that, but it downplays the issue that's happening here. This is a liner tear. This is a loss of toxic process wastewater. There's really no other way around that. It sounded like they said that they had removed the process water that was stored on that stack. So how how are both things possible? How is it that they had removed the processed water, but then they also noticed that there was a, a, a was there a decrease in the water there? I'm, I'm a little bit confused about that part. Yeah, what's been reported to the Florida Department of Environmental Protection is a process wastewater loss, right? So even though they have at this specific area removed the process wastewater from the holding pond, that holding pond still sits atop concrete-like gypsum that's hardened over time. And interstitially between the layers of this fossil gypsum, there still exists process wastewater. So likely that is what's been lost. However, it's it, it speaks back to the transparency problem. You know, normally when we see liner tears, you see a drop in elevation from a stack system like we saw last year. However, now we simply don't have the information and I'm worried that we will not receive it from Mosaic or from the Florida Department of Environmental Protection anytime soon. All we have is a pollution notice submitted along with a critical condition notification that says we have lost an indeterminate amount of this process wastewater. Our guest is Reagan Whitlock, a staff attorney with the Center for Biological Diversity. We're talking about a possible leak of water at a Polk County phosphogypsum stack that's owned by the giant fertilizer company Mosaic. This is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF Tampa live here on October 31st. And I'd like to hear what you have to say about this as well. You can email us at dj at wmnf.org, text 813-433-0885, or you can give us a call at 813-239-9663. I'm taking calls today, and I want to read uh, this text message or part of it from someone who does not sign their name here, but they say that they're a lifelong Mulberry resident, and I think they were referring in this part to the 2016 disaster they say that was the single scariest thing, or it should be for all Floridians, not to mention our local residents. And this person also is um, uh, pointing out to the to that there is this new information about this possible new liner tear or loss of water. So thank you, lifelong Mulberry resident, for that text. I appreciate that. And um, uh, so maybe this is the good time to ask for people or ask you, Reagan, for your opinion about fertilizer, um, you know, you could certainly make an argument that people need food and they need uh, to fertilizer is phosphate is used as fertilizer for food. What would we do, though, if we didn't have as much phosphate being produced in Florida? What are the alternatives? Certainly. And I completely understand the question. I think I'd like to, to reframe this to a, a waste issue, right? What we're calling for is for the phosphate industry to be held accountable for the more than 30 million tons of toxic waste it creates in Florida every single year. You know, we have more than 1 billion tons currently stored in stack systems across the state of Florida. And the industry is trying now to put it into our roadways. You know, this is not a, a phosphate discussion at large. This is based on the, the waste. And this is a company that made $3.6 billion last year, yet is exempt from many of our regulations. What we need is accountability and additional oversight. That is an incredible first step that would greatly reduce the environmental ramifications. 
Wendy writes in and says that she worked on the water when there was the last red tide and she said it was horrendous. And I think that anyone who is near the water uh, during that very serious red tide is uh, understands what you say, Wendy. And so she is asking, what can I do to support this or, or to, to uh, help in this problem? Sure. And, and she brings up a, a, a wonderful point as well as the previous text messenger about how you know, the mulberry issue and the, the 2016 sinkhole should have been a massive wake up call. Piney Point should have been a massive wake up call as well. Those are the two of the worst case scenarios that we have with these gyp stack systems. One fueled a deadly red tide. The other one potentially polluted our aquifer. You know, no regulatory changes happened in the wake of these two events. And I, I really want to hammer that point home. If neither of these were a wake up call, what what possibly are we waiting for? You know, it is time to demand change. And to the question of what can they do, this is a perfect time and a perfect example of a situation where you should tell your local representatives. You know, we have counties you know, passing ordinances and resolutions that ban phosphate mining or ban storage of phosphate mining waste in their areas. We have, you know, folks in the, the federal level championing for better oversight. You can speak to your legislator. You can speak to your policymaker and try to demand change because that's what we need. All right, we're going to try to go to the phones right now because we have a couple of people on the line. Let's see if uh, we're having a little bit of difficulty. Oh, there we go. So we have uh, Chris, Chris in Clearwater. Go ahead. Hi, son, you just asked what are the options to phosphate mining is a phosphate fertilizer. And uh, I would uh, point out ionized water, mineral ions, uh, because uh, they're the best absorbed and you get a full array of them. If you, what I do is I put a little bit of Himalayan salt with a wide array of over 90 minerals in the source water before I pump it through my water ionizer and just put it in a spray bottle, spray it on the plants. And I notice they do so much better. Uh, they bolt and bloom so much more the bumper crops, uh, much fewer bug bites. And uh, sometimes annuals and biennials become perennials. Whereas in contrast with uh, phosphate mining, the three minerals, the, phos the uh, potassium, nitrogen, and phosphorus, those are the three numbers on the fertilizer bags, that most crops will do well or will not do well, but they'll grow and uh, have uh, lower immunity. So farmers feel as if they're dependent on pesticides and uh, fungicides. And that's uh, what's called forced growth. Uh, because uh, you're just giving them the basic uh, three minerals and, uh, you know, the plants are not uh, producing as many vitamins and uh, not absorb, of course, if they've not provided the minerals in the soil, they're not going to absorb them. Uh, you can put ionized water in the soil as well, but um, I'd encourage uh, checking out uh, videos, um, uh, just doing a search online of uh, ionized water agriculture, and you'll find a video by Beverly Rubick, PhD, among others. Well, thanks for that information, Chris. I appreciate that. And I uh, want to try to get one. We're going to move to some some uh, different topics besides just phosphate in just a second. So before we uh, move on, I want to squeeze in as many phone calls as we can. So let's hear from Lenny in Gulfport. Hi, Lenny. What would you like to say? All right. Well, thank you very much for having this program on. It's very critical. Uh, there's a group that's called Florida Right to Clean Water. And what we're trying to do is get a uh, constitutional amendment on the 2024 ballot that would declare that, that clean and healthy water is a fundamental right in Florida. And that fundamental right would take precedence over any other uh, interest. Uh, I think there was recently a court case in which a judge ruled that uh, even though 19,000 people were against the particular, uh, I think it was a Jenny Springs. They were against the, the pumping of uh, water out of Jenny Springs. Uh, the judge ruled that they did not constitute the public interest, but the private company had the public interest. So this amendment would declare that the public's interest is clean and healthy water. And we're trying to get a, a 900,000 petitions signed and sent to the state. And if you go to FloridaRightToClaimWater.org, you can find all the information about that. 
All right. Thanks so much, Lenny. Florida right to cleanwater.org is where that information is. I appreciate you calling in. Thanks so much. Thank you. And our, I want to remind people that our guest is Reagan Whitlock, a staff attorney with the Center for Biological Diversity. And we've been talking so far about a possible leak of water at a Polk County phosphogypsum stack that's owned by the giant fertilizer company Mosaic. This is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. We're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. And I want to switch gears a little bit from talking about phosphate and phosphate waste. Of course, uh, people can still ask their questions by email or or uh, by phone if you're listening live here on October 31st. But let's talk now about manatees. This month, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service announced that they that it might be warranted to reclassify the West Indian manatee from threatened to endangered. What are your thoughts about that, Reagan? Right. This is a, a wonderful step forward for protections of the manatees, a, spe a keystone species in the state of Florida uh, that is considered iconic and has been struggling mightily over the last few years. So a, a bit of history on the protections for the Florida manatee. It was one of the first species to be listed as endangered under the Endangered Species Act. And in 2017, the Fish and Wildlife Service prematurely downlisted the species without considering the possibility of an unusual mortality event. You know, we told the service at the time that seagrass losses, especially those in the Indian River Lagoon, where over the course of a decade, we lost more than 90% of total seagrass coverage, could spark an unusual mortality event that killed the lives of many manatees. That was not considered, and the manatee was prematurely downlisted to threatened in 2017. And unfortunately, we were correct. Exactly what we feared would happen did. And over the course of 2021 to 2022, we lost more than 2,000 Florida manatees. That represents more than 20% of the entire population. And more than half of those deaths came in the Indian River Lagoon, where this species was literally starving to death because of the lack of seagrass forage and coverage. You know, we at the Center for Biological Diversity, along with partners, Miami Waterkeeper, Save the Manatee Club, uh, Frank Gonzalez Garcia, an engineer in Puerto Rico, and the Harvard Animal Law and Policy Clinic, submitted a petition to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which was an aggregation of all of the best science available, and asked them to uplift the manatee back to endangered once again, so that we can reprioritize its recovery, that we can get more appropriations from the legislature, and that we can get more full-time employees dedicated to this effort. And what do we know? Sorry. I was going to ask, what do we know about the scale of the dieback of manatees over the last, say, two or three years? So it has been unprecedented by every uh, every sense of the of the word and the imagination. You know, we lost more than 2,000 in 2021 and 2022 combined. And while 2023 has been better in terms of manatee deaths, we are still on track to lose 500 of these manatees. And it's estimated before the die-off that we only had 8,800 left in the wild, which is likely a gross overestimation of the species viability to begin with. You know, luckily, the service did make an initial finding on our petition that it may be warranted to uplist the manatee to endangered once again, and they have to make a final decision on that petition this winter. So it's our hope that the service recognizes its mistake in 2017 and once again prioritizes the manatee and its recovery. Speaking about what you were, what you called the mistake in 2017, what was that all about? I mean, I I think that that uh, there's been such a as a longtime Florida resident, manatees are loved by everyone in Florida, and uh, no one, I I don't think anyone thought that they were on their way to full recovery three or four years ago. So why in the world were they taken off the endangered status? Well, unfortunately, the manatee was likely a uh, a casualty of what was known as the wildly important goal by the Fish and Wildlife Service. During the Trump administration, the southeastern officials for the Fish and Wildlife Service created a, a program known as the wildly important goal, which was to downlist, delist, or otherwise prevent 30 species every year from being on the endangered species list. And you know, luckily, public interest attorneys, both at the center and uh, region wide, have overturned many of these decisions because they were not based on the best available science. But this was a terrible decision by our Fish and Wildlife Service. And we hope that they recognize that, that was an awful directive and that there are better ways to treat our endangered species. Our guest is Reagan Whitlock, a staff attorney with the Center for Biological Diversity. Right now, we're talking about manatees, and you're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. We're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. 
we were earlier talking about the um, nutrient pollution, perhaps going into the waterways from from gyp stacks and so on. So, what's the connection here between the manatee deaths and water quality? Absolutely, and that, that raises a great point. We discussed Piney Point releasing 215 million gallons of fossil gypsum and processed wastewater into Tampa Bay. Over the course of that 10-day release, Tampa Bay saw more nitrogen inundation, nutrient pollution, into the bay than it receives from all other sources over the course of a given year. And that red tide did kill many manatees. On the east coast of Florida, we have a very similar issue with nutrient pollution, largely spurned by agricultural runoff uh, and poor wastewater infrastructure. Now, the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus that are entered into the Indian River Lagoon have created similar algal blooms, blue-green algae, on the east coast of Florida compared to red tide on the west coast of Florida. And that nutrient pollution has suffocated the seagrasses and led to a precipitous drop in seagrass coverage, which has then led to this massive die-off in Florida manatees. So what can you say about how water quality impacts other things like fisheries, tourism, and health of, of uh, people? Certainly. So at the Center for Biological Diversity, we are dedicated to the preservation of species on the brink of extinction. And that uh, customarily refers to water quality and the quality of their habitat. But it's not just endangered species that are threatened by poor water quality in the state. You know, we saw in Tampa Bay during that red tide, the entire tourism industry shut down. You know, we had beaches full of dead marine life. The smell was untenable. You know, hotels didn't have the same number of, of patrons. The, the concerts, you know, couldn't carry on at many of these hotels and other areas. Charter captains, which make their life off the fishing, you know, in our, our bays and waterways. Everyone struggles when our water quality is not where it should be. In the state of Florida, should be heralded as an incredible spot of biodiversity, an incredible marine ecosystem. However, we are also the site of some of the largest threats. We are, we're talking about the uh, uplisting, perhaps uplisting the manatee from threatened to endangered. And of course that's under something called the Endangered Species Act, which is turning 50, 50 years old this year. Talk about the legacy and importance of the Endangered Species Act. Absolutely. For a for an optimistic positive turn here, the Endangered Species Act turning 50 years old is a, a wonderful milestone and one of the strongest pieces of environmental legislation that we have. The Endangered Species Act is credited with saving 99% of all species that are currently listed, and it's prevented more than 290 extinctions during its lifespan. The Endangered Species Act, in many ways, prioritizes the longevity and recovery of endangered species above all else, and that includes financial considerations. This incredibly strong act has saved species across the country, across the nation, and specifically in the state of Florida, where climate change and sea level rise are causing major lapses in recovery. This is an incredible piece of legislation, an incredible tool, and something that should be heralded as one of the greatest achievements that our Congress has had. Our guest is Reagan Whitlock, a staff attorney with the Center for Biological Diversity. This is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. We're broadcasting from WMNF in Tampa. And if you're listening live on October 31st, I'd like to hear what you have to say as well. You can email us at dj at wmnf.org. You can text 813-433-0885. And if you'd like to, in the last uh, eight minutes or so of the show, if you kind of hurry, you can get on the phone with us as well, 813-239-9663. Let's talk about an, another area of Florida that's been getting some attention, maybe not so much here in, in the uh, West Central Florida area, but in, in Miami, this is a really big story. Tell us about the Miami Pine Rocklands, what it is and what how it's being potentially threatened. Sure. The Pine Rockland is a globally imperiled habitat. It is a, a, a wonderful area that boasts a, an incredible amount of biodiversity. And in Miami, an incredibly urbanized setting, there are still strongholds of this Pine Rockland habitat. And it, it hosts the Florida bonded bat, the Miami tiger beetle, and a, a number of other threatened and endangered species. And this is a great example of the Endangered Species Act at work. You know, the Endangered Species Act protects and preserves 
animals and habitat, but only when it's used correctly by our agencies. There's a threat to the Miami Pine Rocklands known as the Miami Wilds Water Park. This is a, a theme park and water park development slated directly next to Zoo Miami. This overlaps with or is an adjacent to several uh, areas of designated critical habitat for endangered species, including the tiger beetle and the Florida bonneted bat. And critical habitat under the Endangered Species Act is essentially the areas that are desperately needed for animals to recover. You know, primarily with the, the manatee we mentioned earlier, a species cannot survive unless its home is protected, of course. And once critical habitat has been designated, federal agencies cannot take any action without consulting with the Fish and Wildlife Service in order to ensure that critical habitat will not be adversely modified. Unfortunately, in this scenario, the National Park Service released land use restrictions on this area to pave the way for development without consulting to see if critical habitat would be adversely modified. And we had to take the National Park Service to court and that litigation is still proceeding. But the service has admitted in open court that they failed to consult over impacts to this critical habitat. And we're hopeful that that decision will be vacated. But it's a great case study as to the Endangered Species Act. It works, but it only works when our agencies take it under consideration and follow the procedures set forth to protect our fragile species and fragile habitat. A cynic might say at this point, um, you know, I understand what a water park is and I understand how I can get benefit or happiness from that, but why in the world would I want to care about a Miami tiger beetle or Florida bonneted bat? Sure. You know, at the Center for Biological Diversity, we believe that all species have intrinsic value. You know, that means more than just how humans can manipulate the species. It means that they have a right to exist because they were here before us and we hope that they'll be here after us. You know, we want our children to inherit a world where the wild is still alive. I think many folks listening have had impactful moving experiences with the natural world. And, and I hope that you consider that as you move forward that the natural world and humans are, are meant to live synergistically and connected. And we cannot truly appreciate what the loss of an entire species will mean. Let's uh, take a couple of quick phone calls. We have only a few more minutes, but let's let's hear from Kim in Brandon. Hi, Kim, you'd like to talk about fertilizer again? Yes, thank you for taking my call. I'll be brief. Back in the 60s and 70s, if you wanted to fertilize your lawn, it was nonprofit driven. You did it yourself with a spreader. Now we have at least a dozen companies spraying who knows what, um, the, the liquid fertilizer. And when you multiply hundreds of thousands of homes and we're spraying it on St. Augustine, which is not even a native uh, grass, and no one talks about it. I'd like to hear another show. And because, it, you know, it affects people's jobs and money and how their lawn looks. But we're destroying this whole area, and no one talks about the liquid fertilizer trucks that come in there almost every month. And, you know, a customer thinks, thinks there's something wrong with their lawn, so they call them up. They come out and spray. They don't, we don't know what they're spraying or how often, and it's all unnecessary. That was my comment. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Kim. I appreciate that. And uh, Reagan, do you want to comment on that before we move on to Richard? Sure. And I, I think globally, it makes sense to address the use of fertilizer and pesticide use across the nation, but specifically in the state of Florida. And along with what a, a previous caller stated, there are renewable methods of agriculture that can provide you know, plants with the substance they need, including phosphorus, that does not include the extraction of rare earth minerals like phosphate ore from our earth in the unfettered application of fertilizer in a way that will ultimately reach our bays and waterways. Whether it's the west coast of Florida or the east coast, we are consistently seeing nutrient pollution, which is causing ecological collapse. And I want to ask you about this. It's an animal that I, I love animals. I had not heard of this animal, I don't think, until about a week or two ago when it blew up the internet. I think I'm pronouncing it correctly. Javelinas in in uh, Arizona were tearing up uh, golf courses and golf course owners were upset. And then the internet struck back and, and uh, struck a blow for the javelinas. What can you tell us about those desert creatures? 
Sure, sure. And, and while this is outside of my expertise, it is interesting to note, you know, these javelinas are very similar to wild boar that you would see in, in southeast Florida and uh, in, in Georgia, you know, and yes, they have been rooting around golf courses, you know, just like wild hogs would in our, our area, a, a primary thing they do is root around. And I, I can appreciate that when that affects, uh, you know, someone's financial bottom line, it becomes a problem. But it's been it's been great to see folks, uh, whether it's on Twitter or generally online, supporting the javelinas here. For so long, we have experienced whenever there have been negative or perceived to be negative human and wildlife interact interactions, we automatically side on the uh, the financial aspect. But this is simply an animal doing what an animal does and, and rooting around. Uh, and so I, I love to see support for our our, our species uh, and you know animals just doing what it is that they're supposed to do. Yeah, I'm gonna say I'm on Team Javelina, and there were also people commenting about how um, they're native to the desert, but golf courses aren't, and golf courses harm the desert quite a lot as well. So uh, I'm giving up my my allegiances there. But I want to want to thank you very much for joining us on Tuesday Cafe today, Reagan. Thank you so much for having me, Sean. Thanks so much. And sorry, I didn't get to Richard's phone call on the telephone, but uh, we're out of time. Reagan Whitlock is a staff attorney with the Center for Biological Diversity. And if you missed any of this interview, you can watch it on our website, WMNF.org, beginning this afternoon. And I want to thank our phone screener, John Dunn, who did an excellent job today. You've been listening to Tuesday Cafe with Sean Canan. I'm News and Public Affairs Director at WMNF in Tampa. Next week, we have a special show. We're going to be joined, as I said earlier, by NPR's Aya Batraoui. She used to volunteer in the WMNF newsroom. We'll talk about what she and her team have seen in Israel and Gaza over the last few weeks. And during this time slot tomorrow, Shelly Reback will host Midpoint. Her guests will talk about the state of public schools in Florida. Coming up next is Wavemakers with Janet and Tom Sherberger. And I want to thank everyone who supported Tuesday Cafe during our recent fun drive. If you like the information that you get on this show and on this channel, please help us make our goal with your donation at WMNF.org. This has been Tuesday Cafe coming to you live on October 31st, 2023 from the studios of WMNF in Tampa, also broadcasting to St. Petersburg, Clearwater, Sarasota, Lakeland, and beyond. Thanks so much for supporting Community Radio.